Hey, I'd like you to take your Bibles, turn to Hebrews chapter 4 as we continue a series called Better Than. Speaking of the fact that Jesus is better than anything anybody could ever imagine. So if you joined us online, sometimes people check in because we, we do the message online, and you live in the St. Joe area, we'd love for you to come and visit Oak Ridge Community Church. We have a good group of people here, and uh, you will discover that I'm actually more good looking in person than I am on live stream, but no, hey, I, I do with what I can, okay? If you, I like one guy once told me, I was giving him a bad time, he says, you got a complaint? take it to the creator. And so, how do you argue with that, right? I'm not going to have you stand. I know on many Sundays I do, and and we will at other times. I just let you stay seated for the reading of God's word. Hebrews chapter 4, and grab that outline. We've got some pretty heavy stuff to cover this morning, but I think very, very important as we get into it, we'll explain it. Hebrews chapter 4, we're going to read the first four verses, and then the last two verses of that chapter, and we'll fill in with information as we go. The writer says, Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you would seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message, and we'll explain what this means, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest, as he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. That last phrase in this verse will be important this morning where it talks about how God is finished from the foundation of his uh, building, you know, the creation, and how that statement applies to us is very important. For he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. Jump over down to verse 12 of Hebrews 4. Speaking of God's word, it says, The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, joints of morrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Let's pray, all right? Father, thank you for today. Just pray, Lord, as we're in your word, that you would just be with each one that is here. Uh, Lord, for those in our church today who are suffering from sickness or are out of town, just protect them. I think of Betty's son this morning, that you would just watch over them. And Father, anyone here who has some heavy burdens, God, who maybe is just struggling with resting in you, and Lord, it, it, it takes us making some decisions to enter into the peace that you give us and help us to do that. Thank you for the wonderful time we had singing songs that lift up the name of Christ. And we give you praise. Amen. So grab your outline. Last week we talked a little bit about stress. I wonder if anybody had a stress-free life this week, huh? Hope everything went perfect for you. No pressures, nothing. Everything is just great as can be. The reality is, as you know, we've got some, we all go through stuff, right? And we do. Doesn't matter where you're at, as we'll see in your relationship with Christ, we all go through those times that you feel overwhelmed. There was a survey done in 2014, and I thought this hits the nail on the head, but it says there's the top four stress issues in, could you go back to the other one? No, wait, we're going. Oh, there we go, thank you, thank you. Son, you're fired. Anyway, uh, uh, (laughs) I wouldn't want to be back there, but the top four stress issues in this one survey were, and you can probably relate to this, they were job, they were money, they were health, and they were relationships. That pretty much does hit life, doesn't it? That pretty much covers everything. And we know this, we talked about this, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this in just a moment, but life events affect us. That's just the way it is. And how we respond to those events are very, is very important And we said last week, and we will reiterate it this morning, attitude, attitude matters, okay? 
On your outline, I mentioned this, what was called the Holmes Ray Stress Life Indicator. So we're going to have a little fun this morning, all right? There was a psychologist, I guess, by the name of Richard Ray, and he came up with this, I think with one of his colleagues, um, in which they looked at 43 life events. How they chose the 43, I don't know. But what they did is they took 43 life events that you and I would have happened to us over a one-year span, and they gave numerical values to each one of these. And, uh, and how they figured that out, I don't know. I tried to get more information, but I failed but on that. But they put a numerical value to these events and how these events would affect us. So, for example, if you got married this year, there would be a, an example of 50 points, okay? Where I'm going to explain how this all goes together. Uh, major changes in finances would be, they gave a 38 as a numerical value. A son or daughter leaving home, 29. Taking out a loan, that should have been out. I didn't do very good there. Taking out a loan, 17. Um, the loss of loved ones, depending on who those individuals were. A major personal injury or an illness had a numerical value of 53. Changing to a different life of, line of work had a 36. Major change in the number of arguments with your spouse, either a lot less uh, or more. You, regarding child rearing, personal habits, etc. Outstanding personal achievements got a 28. Troubles with the boss says only 23. It's lower than that, isn't it, Emily? It's a zero, right? Troubles with the boss for you. Vacation got a 13. Anyway, these 43 life events were numbered from 100, which was the highest, down to 11 which the 11, in fact, was minor violations of the law. Uh, but, like, we're not talking robbing a bank. We're talking traffic tickets, jaywalking. I love that one. Disturbing the peace. How do you only get an 11 for disturbing the peace? Anyway, what you do is you go through this, and you, you look at all of these issues and what, what's happened to you over the last year, and then you circle the number, and then you add them all up. If your score came to 150 points or less, it means that you have a relative low amount of life change, and so you have a low susceptibility to having a health-related issue in the next two years. Now, is that good to know? Or in the next year? If you scored 150 to 300 points, I've taken this test before. My last one was under 150. You guys are so good. Um, 150 to 300 implies about a 50% chance of a major health breakdown in the next two years. And if you scored over 300, the odds rose to about 80%. So you can find this, you, in fact, you could take this thing, at, get this, at the American Institute of Stress website. I spend days there. No, I'm just kidding. But anyway, whatever you think of something like this, here's the deal. People are trying to figure out how to deal with the overwhelming stuff that comes into their life, right? And we do that too as Christians. We do. We want to know how to handle all of the stress and all of the stuff that happens that maybe we're not ready for or throws us off. So this morning, I want to talk about how you and I can learn to rest in God no matter what is happening. How we can enjoy or at least have God's peace in us on a regular basis. It's not a magic formula. I'm not going to tell you something that you've probably never heard before. As we're going to discover, it's, a lot of it is applying what God has put right before us. So... I'd like you to take your Bibles, grab the outline. We're going to look at three thoughts. There's a lot of bullet points, but that's just more because I'm, you got to understand, I'm a kind of a real detailed guy on stuff like this, and I want to just give you some information. But on the screen, I want to just share three thoughts that I think can help us to handle stress, and I'll explain why as we go. And not just stress, but things that happen in our lives. We all have those 
life events, some that we had no, no idea they were going to happen. So the first one that we're going to talk about comes actually from the book of chapter 3. Because I do believe this, that what you believe affects how you live and how you respond. I do. And depending on what I have my belief in and what my foundation is and what is my, the center of my life, it will affect how I respond and how I react, or it should. I also believe that this is one of the reasons why Christianity is not, been never was made to live alone, that we need each other. We need encouragement. We need accountability. It's part of the Christian walk to be a part of a group of people. And so, as we're going to see from Hebrews chapter 3, and we're gonna, I'm going to try to answer a question or something you might have. Maybe you haven't, maybe you don't. But regarding a person's heart. But let's begin by just talking about what he says very quickly in Hebrews chapter 3. Okay, so we've read chapter 4, but we need to back up. In ver- we talked about verse 12 last week. We talked about taking care that we guard against falling away from the living God or that whoever's hearing this message, and we'll explain it in a minute, that they don't get caught up in unbelief. In verse 13, he, he tells us to exhort one another, to encourage one another. The word exhort has different meanings. It can mean to come alongside somebody and kind of be a cheerleader and really encourage them as, as they're walking through life, other times the word describes confrontation out of love, that you want to help somebody change, you want to help somebody deal with stuff in their life, so you, can, you, you confront them, right? That's what the word exhort means. It has a couple of different meanings. But either way, when you look at verse number 12, where it talks about falling away or taking care, or if verse 13 says about hard, getting hardened because of the deceitfulness of sin, the reality is it's because of our response to a situation that leads to this. All of this is on me. If I'm going through a situation and I begin to get bitter and angry at God or at other people, it's on me to deal with that. It, he's very clear the way that he words it in the Greek. He makes sure that everything he talks about, like taking care and, and not falling away, that, that it's on me to not do that. And so I need to know why I believe what I believe and allow that to be a part of who I am and making my decisions and how I respond to life based on what I believe, what the Bible teaches so when he says that in verse number 12 and 13, he's, we need to encourage each other. We need to encourage each other. We, we turn on the news, we're depressed for days. And, and sometimes, and I get it, life, it's not exact. we don't live in a wonderful world, shall we say, but we live in a world with a wonderful God. You have to remember too, and I always have to remind myself that when he's, He's writing this letter and it's being read at the church, wherever that church is, whoever's teaching on this letter back in the ancient world even, that there were three groups of people that are listening to this letter, just as there are in most churches in the world today. You have the Christians that are maybe young in their faith or they've been a Christian for a long time, but they're they're just, they just aren't making much progress. In fact, they easily get derailed. They easily stumble. They, they're immature in their faith. And, and then you have those that are growing in their faith and really are beginning, they're understanding what it means to walk with God and they're growing. Both of those groups of Christians are not, you know, problem free, but both of them will respond differently to situations going on. So you have the, the, the immature or the, the struggling Christians, you got the growing Christians, the third group of people here in this message are people who don't have a relationship with Christ. Those three groups are found in almost every church across the globe today. They fit, you fit into one of the three. We all do. And so as I read the letter to the Hebrews, sometimes the writer has a specific audience in mind of those three groups even though what he says can apply to everybody across the board, he's zeroing in on one group of people. 
at a particular time in his letter. I like what verse, and we're going to come back to verse 13 in a minute, but I like what verse number 14 says. It's the same thing that he said in verse 6. It's an encouraging word from the writer. He says, when, for we have come to share in Christ. So that means we partakers with Christ. We, we are, are part of his church. You become a Christian. He says in verse 6, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. It makes it sound like it's up to me to keep myself saved, and it's not. And he's not saying that you can lose your salvation. He's not saying that either. In fact, the way that he words it, he's saying, I want you to know that if you truly know God, yes, you're going to have your tough times. Yes, you're going to struggle. Yes, you might, you know, wrestle with some things. You might have doubts. You might, you know, whatever the issue is, but... You never turn your back on God completely. And I'm going to explain why he says that and why it's important. So the thing I want to focus on is what we believe matters. When it comes to experiencing God's peace and rest in a world that seems to just be spiraling towards hell... One of the things that is important is knowing what I believe and that I need others in my life to help me to keep moving on. We all do. As he, as so verse 14 to me is an encouragement. God keeps me to, as his child and as we're going to see from chapter 4, I do hold on to, and so do you, to the confidence of what God has done in our life. That no matter what happens, I may wrestle, I may struggle, God doesn't let me go, and I don't let go of him in the big picture. When you come to verses 15 through 19, he uses certain words that kind of wake wake us up. He says, he's talking about the children of Israel. Remember what we said? He goes back to the children of Israel a lot to make a point. So in verses 15 through 19, he uses words in verse 16 like rebelled. Verse 15, he used the word hardened. Verse 17, he used the word sinned. Verse 18, he talks about the children of Israel were disobedient. Verse 19, that they were unbelievers. They were people who never entered the promised land. Ever. They were the ones who led to... Israel meandering around 40 years in the wilderness until certain numbers of them died off because of their unbelief. And they never changed their attitudes in all the time that they wandered through the wilderness. They were unbelievers. And he's going to contrast those people with you and me in a minute. But I want to answer a question because I've had this asked to me at times over the years can a christian's conscience be seared can a christian's heart become so hard that they turn away from god and i've had people ask that maybe not here but over the years that question has come across my desk and he deals with it right here and if you look at your outline i'm just going to walk through this very quickly okay i'm going to give you the thumbnail sketch of of this because some people say well that in verse 13 he talks about people have been hardened by the deceitfulness of sin so let me just sum it up this way that there's a word that the writer of hebrews chooses to describe somebody hardening their heart he uses it four times In three of those, he's quoting from Psalm 95, and it's a reference to the unbelieving Israelites. Okay? The other two times that verse, that same word is used in the Bible, once by Luke in Acts, and once by Paul in Romans, in both those cases, it is speaking about non Christians. People have never put their faith in Christ. In Romans 9, 18, it talks about Pharaoh's heart being hardened. Well, Pharaoh wasn't a believer. 
It's also clear in Acts that those people being mentioned as having hard hearts were not believers. They weren't. The thing that throws you off is at the beginning of verse 12 here in Hebrews 3, he calls these people brothers. Well, is he talking about Christians? Is he talking about other Jews? I don't know, but I do know this, that when you take the word and you look at the word hardened, there's only two or three Greek words that are used to describe somebody having a hard heart. In none of the instances is it speaking to Christians having a hard heart that a Christian could actually harden their heart so much towards God that they totally abandon what they believe. You will not find it in the New Testament. You won't, because you can't. And the reason that you can't is when you become a child of God, God becomes indwelling in our life. The Holy Spirit moves in and takes over. Do we struggle? Yes. Do we have lack of faith sometimes? Yes. Do we wrestle with sin? Yes. But no Christian ever completely hardens their heart. Jesus said to the disciples once, he said, you know, he says, you guys have a hard heart. So people think, "Uh uh-oh, well, what does that mean? If anybody was a Christian, it was the, you know, the disciples. Well, here's the deal. When Jesus said that, he had fed the 5,000, he had walked on water, and the disciples just didn't get it. They wouldn't, they just wouldn't accept everything happening. Let me also tell you that at that point in their life, they were much like the Old Testament Christians. They did not have the Holy Spirit living in them. In fact, Jesus later would say to them, the Holy Spirit's with you, but you don't have him in you, but he is going to be in you once I go back to heaven. There's a big difference between before the cross and after the cross, before the resurrection and after the resurrection in our lives. And so all I'm saying to you is that you may struggle as a Christian, but I don't believe that a Christian ever gets to the point that you can totally throw your, throw your faith away, become a non-believer, apostatize, whatever the word is. So that's why the people that the writer is talking to in Hebrews 3, beginning around verse 12, even back to verse 7, the main audience he's addressing is he's challenging people who don't have a relationship with Christ to become believers. They're, they're, they're relying on their religion. They're relying on their keeping certain rules and laws. We call it legalism to be made right with God. And the writer of Hebrews says, you're missing out. You're missing the point. But just because a Christian can't harden their heart, and I put this here at the very bottom where I wrote the word practical, it doesn't mean that we slack in our relationship with God. It doesn't mean I start to coast in my walk with God thinking, well, you know, I know I won't ever harden my heart, so it's okay if I sin, but it's not. Romans 6.1 tells us that. The Spirit is in us. He's convicting us. He's conforming us to the image of Christ. That's his job. (laughs) It's what he does. In fact, it's what he does best. For you as a Christian, for me as a Christian. When we sin, we grieve God. The Bible's very clear on that. So we repent, we change, we get things right. Okay? But attitude matters being held accountable because we love each other as as Christians matters, what we believe matters. But then here to me is the most important part of this morning. It's the second point, and I went much longer on the first one than I intended, but if you want to experience, if I want to experience God's peace and rest on a daily basis, there are two things that I have to do. You say, wait a minute, you don't earn your salvation, right? Right but you're not passive either in our relationship with God. In Hebrews chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, the writer is very clear. He compares you and I to the unbelievers in the wilderness who wandered. He says in verse 2 that the good news came to us just as to them, and he's pointing back to the Israelites. He says the Israelites had a chance to enter the land of Canaan to rest. But he says in verse number 2, for good news came to us just as to them, But the message they heard did not benefit them. Why didn't it benefit them? Look at the end of verse 2. Because they were not united by what? By faith with those who listened. Faith is the key word. It's the key word. Everything that you and I have, 
to experience what God wants is found in Christ alone. We sang it this morning. The writer is now shifting to talk about a new identity. Who you are in Christ. So I need to ask the question, do you believe that what the Bible says about who you are in Christ, do you believe that? Do you believe you're adopted? Do I believe that I'm forgiven? Do I believe that God has brought me into his family and declared me righteous right before him and now is working in my life to conform me to the image of Christ? He's given me everything I need through faith in him. Do we believe that? I think a lot of times we don't. Or I say that I do, but I don't act on it. It's like a key. If someone gave me the keys to a 69 Camaro and said it's yours, and I start feeling guilty. I can't drive that car. I'm a pastor. I would end, I, that guilt would be gone in about three seconds. But I mean, it's the same thing. It's a, you have it before you, but well, what do you do with it? And when he's talking here in Hebrews 4, he says, listen, God wants to give you and wants you to experience him, not through some religious expressions, like for them it was sacrificing or keeping these legalistic rules, it was by faith. When you become a Christian, everything changes. That's why, as we look a little further... He's, he's, he gives us peace and rest. Now look at verse number three. He talks about how God's works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has somewhere spoken in verse four of the seventh day in this way. God rested on the seventh day, okay? When God's work of creation was done. Because it looks like the writer just shifts gears and loses us, right? He's talking about having faith and how we have faith in Christ and and all. And all of a sudden he starts talking about God's creation. When God finished his creation, what did he say? He looked out at it and he said, it was what? Good. And at the end of the seven, six days, he said two words. It was what? Very good. There was nothing more to be added to creation, right? It was done. There is nothing more to be added to the Christian faith than what God has done. That's the point he's making. If you want to experience rest in the midst of the world just swirling around you and life throwing you curveball after curveball, you have to lean on the fact that everything you need to live in peace and rest and manage the storms in your life is in Christ alone and there is nothing else that matters or that you need believe that but we don't act on it a lot do we let's be honest it's easier to try to fix it ourselves the writer says everything you need right here in christ alone just as when god was done he said it was very good with the creation when you were saved he said it's very good i've given you everything you need The Christian life is a life of faith, but it's also a life of application of what he's taught us and given us. If I'm in the midst of a storm and I just never talk to God and I don't pray and I don't read the word, do you think that that not doing that is going to help me handle the stress? It won't. Because he's given me what I need to handle the stress, But I got a part to play in that. And that is, I've got to be in the word, as we're going to see. But I have to have faith, and I have to obey. I have to do what God says. Look at your outline. There's a point in the middle of the, on the back there, where where that second point of God's rest requires faith and obedience. We are to live by faith. We're to trust in what God has said. But we're to live out what we know the word tells us. We rest in him when we do this. You know why? Because he provides everything spiritually that we need. He talks about David and Joshua, two of the big heroes of the Jewish uh, people who they never entered into full rest. You know why? Because Joshua brings the people into the promised land 
and they, they fight with the people of the promised land. Even though God said, I'll give you the victory, they didn't believe that. And David wanted his people to experience God's peace in their life. But even David didn't do that. Remember, once he sinned, I mean, he still loved God, and God still used him, but boy, he went through some rough times, didn't he? Man. The point I'm trying to make is when you look at a place like verse number nine he says there remains a sabbath rest for the people of god we're the people of god that's you and that's me if we're believers there is a future rest but there's a present rest where when everything is swirling around me he has given me all i need you see the point of faith in the christian life but there's a point of obedience too where i do what he says i don't do stuff to earn god's favor when I study the scriptures and then I apply it to my life, then God is able to work and, I, and he works in us. Philippians 2 says, God is working, but I have a responsibility to do my part. That's Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Everything I need to handle whatever comes up my way, same with you, and sometimes it's overwhelming. And it doesn't mean that we respond perfectly. And it doesn't mean that life is easy because let's be honest, it's not. But aren't you glad if you're a Christian that you have living in you the creator of the universe who has given us the word and said, if you take this book and you learn it and you apply it, how to handle situations and by faith you rest in me and trust in me, that's Galatians 5, walking in the Spirit, allowing God to, to work in our lives and, and to change us. Then he says, I can give you rest. Even It, it doesn't mean you sometimes don't get not up inside, but you say, Lord, I'm feeling this, but I know based on what you've told me that you're not letting me go and that you love me. And maybe there's a lesson for me here, but more than anything, God, I don't want to get derailed. I don't want to allow a circumstance to hurt my walk with you. And I believe that you've given me everything I need. Isn't that cool? You know how long it took me to figure this out? Several years after becoming a Christian until it, it hit me. You know what? This is a spiritual rest. He is sovereign. He is my Lord. He loves us. He accepts us. Do you not think that God wants you and I to experience life as he wants it to more than you and I want to experience it? He loves us. I have to obey him. I do have to follow what the word of God teaches and apply it. But also I have to walk by faith. I have to believe what he says. And that's what he's talking about. And the third and final thing, and it's right there on your notes very quickly, let me just say it. It's God's word where we find complete rest. I love verse 12. The word of God is living and active. God's, God's word is life-changing. Why? Because the Holy Spirit uses his word to change lives. The Holy Spirit says the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. He pierces into our very being. He discerns. The Word of God will discern us. It'll point stuff out. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says that. He's working in us. He's doing things. The Word of God does that. And the reason I say the Word of God gives complete rest is because the Bible points out the things that we need to do and then shows us how, about who God is and what he's done for us. The answer to life's issues. The answer to dealing with the stress that we have is found in the word of God. You say, well, that's too simple. Precisely. You might think, well, don't you ever get stressed? Yes, I do. Do I, do I ever feel like circumstances are like pounding on me? Yes. I do. do. Do I ever get a little bit off kilter? Yes, I do. 
But then the Holy Spirit goes, excuse me, son, do you realize what Christ has done? You don't have to go through the difficulty alone. God walks with you. In fact, God's here to carry us. But I will say this, if you're going through a difficult time, if you're not in the word and you're not seeking God and you're not getting encouraged by others, it's going to be tough to make it through. Trust me, <laughs> been there, done that. doesn't work. I'm sold on the fact that God wants you and I to experience his rest and his peace. And as you do, how you and I walk through life, not to earn favor with God, not to score points with God, because he can't, because he's already accepted you completely. But people see how we live. We are the walking billboard for God. I don't handle stress relation, situations so that you know, I can say, oh, look at Jesus, look at, but people will see, and sometimes they'll ask you a question, you know, hey, life's tough, and how are you doing that? How are you handling it? Boy, is that like not God throwing open a door so you can tell your story? Well, let me tell you what God's done for me. Here's how Jesus helps me to handle this. This isn't rocket science. It's not. Remember, I got a PhD, poor, hopeless dope. It's not rocket science. This is taking God's word and by faith, believing what he says and then saying, Spirit of God, help me to apply it. And when I begin to walk away from that, Holy Spirit convicts and he yanks me back and says, get back on here. Let's get back on track. God wants you and I to experience life more than we do. Wow, that's cool. Let's pray. You can find more messages like this one at oakridgebc.org and like us on Facebook for encouragement and event updates right to your newsfeed. Thank you for listening to today's message from Oak Ridge Community Church.